Hello everyone and thank you for choosing to watch this video. My name is Andras Nikovic and I'll try to summarize the current literature around the ultrasound use and echocardiography use, peri-arrest, intra-arrest, post-arrest and I'll show you a couple of cases from our recent archives. The first clinical vignette, we had a patient in his 60s, not much past medical history, he was undergoing a prostatectomy in theatres where he had a VF arrest. So then they started CPR and they requested our presence in theatres and we provided some help uh, with the ultrasound and with echocardiography. So we'll come back to this later. First, a bit of a comparison between out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and intra or in-hospital cardiac arrest. So most out-of-hospital cardiac arrest would be VFVT arrest and most in-hospital cardiac arrest uh, up to about 80% would be PEA arrest. So very different patient cohort and a very different way of using the ultrasound peri-arrest. The role of POCUS under these circumstances would be to potentially identify reversible causes. You may want to try to assist with determining prognosis. So that is looking for any cardiac activity or the lack of cardiac activity. If you look at the heart and, and it's obvious that uh, there's no point continuing your efforts, like for example, there's a clot in, in the ventricle, then uh, that will help for the whole team to decide to stop the efforts. And then assess efficacy of chest compressions. I'm not, not too sure about that. It's, it's pretty hard to, to see the heart with ongoing uh, cardiac compressions. Maybe with toe you, you may be able to do that a bit better, but certainly not with TTE. However, be very careful because uh, the use of ultrasound during the arrest, it's not without harms. Delays in, in chest compressions or starting chest compressions as well as if you find something and you're thinking you can, you're seeing something and you act on it and it wasn't there, um, that, that might be very uh, harmful. For example, you thought you saw a pericardial tamponade, but there wasn't one. So then uh, that, that can be very problematic. So continuing on on that same thought, um, the PA side of the algorithm, I guess in the past without using the ultrasound, there was only the one PA arrest. However, now there's the two kinds of PA arrest we can distinguish between the pseudo PEA and the true PEA arrest. And that's with the use of the ultrasound. So you have a look at the heart. If you see some organized myocardial activity, however, you don't see any pulse, they call that a pseudo PEA. And that has a better prognosis compared to the true PEA when there's no organized cardiac activity there's a cardiac standstill that you can see on the ultrasound and this one has a much worse survival rate. Also, you can try and identify reversible causes and post-arrest, post-ROSC, uh, this might have a role when you have a sequential exam of the heart, the lungs, the abdomen and vascular structures and, and trying to uh, decide what was causing the arrest as well as how to optimize the patient post arrest. There's millions of protocols. Uh, if you look it up on the internet, there's papers published many, 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 as you see here, all these acronyms, they are uh, various protocols using the ultrasound, using the echocardiography uh, during the arrest. Um, I selected just one, uh, the Easy ALS, and uh, the colorful image is, is from that paper. So you see that um, during the arrest, there's a role for performing your ultrasound where you look for cardiac standstill or organized uh, myocardial activity. 
So I guess that's easy enough to see if the patient has good windows. So they go on and they recommend trying to identify those reversible causes, you know, the H's and T's. However, in my view, these are really very important, really very difficult to do during the arrest. These conditions, oftentimes, they're hard enough to, to diagnose in a awake patient or a, or, a, or a less unstable patient in the ICU or in the emergency department. And then you can add in the added um, anxiety and, and all those people around the patient who are just arrested and you're trying to do your scan and trying to decide whether that uh, ventricle looks normal size or is, is the right ventricle uh, massively dilated or the whole heart is underfilled. So I, I, in my view, intra-arrest, this would be extremely hard. This would be extremely hard to diagnose these things. Potentially, you may be able to see a, a large pericardial tamponade, but uh, probably not much else. So let's see the guidelines around the topic. Uh, the American Society of Crit Care Medicine, uh, they came up with the guidelines from 2016. And in this one, they do suggest the use of bedside cardiac ultrasound. It may be performed during asystole to guide further efforts. And as you see here, they, they're recommending to try to um, identify a few of these um, reversible causes. And yeah, um, I'm not sure we'd be able to see many of these intra arrest. However, if there's something very obvious, then yes, by all means. And then they do recommend to use bedside cardiac ultrasound to actually detect PEA and then go down that side of the algorithm. Or if you see the heart fibrillating, then um, go down the shockable part of the algorithm. So you're looking for that organized cardiac activity. And there's papers, I'll show you a bit later, that showing that if there is no organized cardiac activity, there's almost 100% mortality for those patients. So there's important prognostic implications here. But uh, you can identify that pseudo PA where there may be something reversible. So you would give more fluid or, or you would deal with that uh, pericardial effusion if you can. So they also recommend using bedside cardiac ultrasound uh, in the VTVF side of the algorithm and especially post ROSC. Uh, looking for regional wall motion abnormalities. However, again, so this would be very, very difficult. So you have to be mindful of that post-arrest stunning where everything looks abnormal, all wall motion abnormalities that you can detect. So they can be temporary, but they're very real post-arrest. And the patient might have had some prior regional wall motion abnormalities. And then uh, that would be a bit of uh, misleading um, when, when you do your assessment. And then they, they recommend that you might be using the ultrasound for identifying other pre-existing problems that might have led to that arrest. They also recommend transesophageal echo, and it may be especially helpful in theaters where they were already using uh, the TEE and it might already be in place and then it might help with those resuscitative efforts. And I'd like to just make a, a side comment here that the toe probe can be left in place while you're doing the shocks. So that's, that's all good. So the, the toe probe can be left in place by according to current guidelines. So let's move on. 2022, uh, more recent, the ILCO uh, summary statement. And this one's a pretty good uh, paper. So they go through a few controversial topics around um, ALS, B BLS and, and uh, pediatric life support. And they uh, summarize the available literature. Uh, so I, I would recommend to everyone to, to read this paper because it, it's really very useful. So in this one, 
uh, based on very low certainty evidence, they um, did look for studies and they only, only found one study uh, and that was an old one, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look it up, I'll show you a bit later. So they um, uh, did 48 patients, all the others are mostly observational studies, so that's, that's how they were trying to look up all the available literature. So this is a very low certainty evidence because uh, all these are observational, ob uh, observational studies and case studies and case series. So this is the only one uh, that they um, listed. And this one is from 1997. And you see these numbers, hard to believe. Uh, I'm not going to quote them. Uh, they did these with toes and the post-arrest diagnoses were mostly on post-mortems. So very old study and I'm not sure uh, how much we can uh, trust the numbers based on this study. So the current uh, ILCO recommendations, and I'd like to stress this part here. So they suggest against routine use of POCUS during CPR. So that's, that's a, a pretty strong statement. So they do suggest against the routine use of POCUS. So if you remember uh, uh, the ALS algorithm and the ALS teaching, the ALS courses, um, we, we were teaching to ask for uh, an echo and to try to rule out uh, some of those uh, H's and T's. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was still like that. However, they have changed their recommendations and now they, use, they do suggest against routine use of POCUS. This is based on weak and low certainty evidence. However, if uh, there is someone experienced, then uh, without interrupting the CPR, it may be considered as an as a additional diagnostic tool. And it should be carefully considered and weighed against the risks of interrupting chest compressions and also misinterpreting these findings. So very strong uh, recommendations are uh, really, really against the use of ultrasound, only if there's someone available who is well trained in the use of ultrasound and echocardiography, they can be uh, consider they, they might be considering using it uh, peri intra arrest. However, that will have to be very, uh, very much weighed against the risks of interrupting compressions. So good quality uh, chest compressions is paramount and you shouldn't be interfering with that in any way with your ultrasound probe. And they base these recommendations on, uh, on the following uh, statements. So because uh, in, in that literature that they looked up and uh, those few studies that they found, there's very inconsistent definitions on, on what uh, you can use as, as a sonographic evidence of, of uh, a cardiac arrest. Even, you know, the, the, the presence or lack of cardiac activity, even that is so variable that um, it's really, really hard to decide which one to use. I'll, I'll show you later. Obviously, these studies are very high risk for selection bias. But on the other hand, the clinical context might be important. So if the patient is in theater or post cardiac surgery, then uh, the tamponade would be very high likelihood. So in that case, uh, the, the, the use of ultrasound can be considered and, and you, you might um, have a better outcome if you actually start with using the ultrasound during the arrest. So why is all, all these uh, recommendations? So they did say that uh, the good quality chest compressions are the most important part of your CPR. And we know that there is evidence now showing that uh, POCUS would increase uh, the, the duration of pauses in chest compressions. 
I'll show you the paper uh, supporting that finding. In 2017, they did a study and they, not, not too many patients, 23, but it was enough to, to show that if they did a POCUS uh, during pulse check, the, the length or the, the period of, of uh, no chest compressions was significantly, um, was significantly longer. So that's why they, uh, they recommend that you be very careful and trying not to interfere with, with a good quality ALS and good quality CPR. And then again, if, if you go back further in time and, and um, you, you look into the, um, the, the pulse check itself, so that was taken out of the, of the algorithms uh, many years ago now. Uh, because it's very not reliable and, and even the pulse check itself can uh, interrupt uh, the CPR for a long period of time, much longer than that 10 seconds that's recommended. So they did this study with um, pre-hospital providers. They took them in into theaters uh, and they asked them to check for a pulse on intraop patients those patients were either on the cardiopulmonary bypass without a pulse or they had a pulse. So these uh, providers were asked to, to check for a pulse. And as you see, many, many, many of them uh, couldn't uh, detect or couldn't say with certainty whether there was a pulse or not. It's, it's very close to, you know, just being just flipping a coin and deciding whether there's a pulse or, or not. And these, these people were highly trained in finding a pulse. So it's very, very hard to see, uh, very, very hard to say that um, you should prolong that pulse check uh, period. And that's why in, in the current ALS algorithms, after shock or after um, after the shock, you don't you don't do a pulse check. You just uh, go back on the chest straight on, and you continue your chest compressions. More recent uh, local guidelines: the Australian Resuscitation Council, twenty twenty three August. Um, so they make a statement that uh, ultrasound can be used in the identification of cardiac or non-cardiac causes of the arrest. There may be a prognostic value attached to it when you look for the presence or absence of sonographic cardiac motion. And when there's no uh, cardiac motion, they do recognize that then uh, the, the survival rate is, is really, really very bad. So the current recommendation from the Australian Resuscitation Council is that if ultrasound is available and if it can be performed without interfering uh, with chest compressions mostly, then it may be considered uh, to, to, to be used to identify reversible causes. All right, so what studies are these recommendations are based. So the, there was a, a review paper, 12 papers, almost 600 patients from 2012. And in this one, they found, as you see here from, from the table, that um, if uh, you saw no cardiac activity, no cardiac contractility, it's very, very rare that the patient achieved ROSC. Not zero, the chances are not zero, but very, very low. So as you see, the vast majority of those patients did not achieve ROSC, but there were a few who did. And then uh, on the other hand, when there is some cardiac contractility seen on echo, then um, roughly about half of them had uh, ROSC and the other half did not have ROSC. 2019, shock ED uh, paper. And 
most of most of these uh, studies come from the emergency medicine literature. They do a lot of uh, research in the field of, of POCUS and ultrasound use in general as well. So these are mostly from uh, the emergency department. So this one's a bigger one. They did it on, on 180 patients and they found that if they demonstrated some cardiac activity uh, in a patient who arrested, then that led to a higher incidence of intubation, they had more adrenaline, they had longer CPRs as compared to those who did not have any cardiac activity seen. And as you see here, the outcomes, um, so this is when they achieved ROSC or when they survived to hospital admission or when they survived to hospital discharge. And as you see, when uh, there was some uh, cardiac activity found on POCUS, then a higher percentage of those patients uh, achieved ROSC as compared to those who did not have uh, cardiac activity on POCUS. Same applies to uh, hospital admission and uh, hospital discharge. So very low numbers, very little survival, but nevertheless, uh, the focus, especially the negative prediction, if there is no cardiac activity, then uh, the survival is extremely low. Another review paper, systematic review uh, from 2020, 15 patients, two and a half thousand all, uh, all in all. So in this one, they trying to assess sonographic cardiac motion as a predictor of mortality. And I, I referred this uh, to this paper earlier on. So see how uh, variable that uh, definition of cardiac movement is. Um, and as, as you see, so there's even, even uh, any motion of, of atria or ventricular motion or valvular motion. Or, and then a lot of other things uh, are uh, in, included in this one. In my view, for an organized cardiac activity, you should see some valvular movement. So then that means that there is some flow through that heart. So that's that's my, my opinion. So I think uh, that, that would be the minimum to, to, to try to demonstrate some flow through that heart. And then uh, on the other hand, when you, uh, when you see a big clot um, in your heart, then obviously then you can stop uh, uh, the resuscitation efforts. And the forest plot uh, for the same. So if there is some ca uh, cardiac activity detected on the POCUS, then there's a higher chance of ROSC. So that's, how, that's what they found in this review. Uh, same uh, results supported uh, by numbers. So let's see, these are the ones who did or did not survive to hospital admission. And as you see here, when there is no cardiac motion, most of those uh, will have a, a bad outcome. If there was cardiac motion, then some of them, about a third of them, would have a, a good outcome. Again, uh, ruling out if there's no cardiac output or cardiac motion, sorry, ruling uh, out and, and maybe stopping resuscitation efforts. So that, that might be one use for the POCUS during the arrest. So these are the most recent August 2023 20, guidelines from uh, the ARC, Australian Council. So wh what, where can you do uh, any sort of assessment or how, how can you do your um, assessment? So while they're doing the CPR, you can put your ultrasound probe on and get into position. When they're gonna attach the monitor, you're already ready to record that loop. Rhythm assessment, you have about 10 seconds while they're charging the defibrillator. So save that image and then you can go back to it when they're gonna return to uh, continuing the, the chest compressions, whichever side they're gonna go down, um, you have about 10 seconds to record a loop and then you can go back to it and, and, and assess it. There's a paper <coughs> from uh, Australia. Again, uh, they called this the Coach Red, 
where they incorporated the ultrasound use into your coached algorithm. So you continue compressions and echo uh, and get into position. And then as you start doing your rhythm check and charging the defibrillator, you record your echo and then you, ta uh, you take your echo off and then they can either shock the patient or dump the charge and return to chest compressions. And they recommend trying to wedge yourself in while they're doing the, the resuscitation. So these would be the, uh, the ultrasound people uh, because all the other places would be uh, occupied. So there'll be an airway person, there'll be a chest compression person, maybe there'll be another chest compression or over here. There'll be someone doing drugs, there'll be a team leader, there'll, there'll be another uh, 55 people just around the the uh, the arrest as as it's very usual uh, you know high anxiety situations in the hospital so there'll be many many people around so it's very hard to find a spot and then trying to put your probe on uh, onto the patient most of them you can do uh, the subcostal approach and um, that way you you may be helpful when uh, uh, you know to help the team leader to decide what to do which side of the algorithm did you identify anything reversible and so on so this case uh, that we started presenting on the first slide um, so they when we arrived into theater uh, cpr was in progress Lots of people, lots of lots of people, so very little room to maneuver the ultrasound machine in. But that's, that's what I did. I went in at, uh, and I tried to identify the, the subcostal approach. So these are the uh, chest compressions that are ongoing. Although, uh, at the same time, while, while the, while the uh, chest compressions are going, as you see here, you, you can have a quick look at the chest. So if you see B lines, those would be against a uh, pneumothorax. So as you see here on the R1 zone, right upper anterior zone, we have lots of B lines, which is very abnormal, but uh, you can rule out uh, a pneumothorax in this location. Same here, I kind of lost the, the pleural line, but uh, still the chest compressions are going. Moving down to the right two zone, uh, a, a bit further down uh, anterior chest. Again, lots of B lines uh, as the chest compressions are going. So pneumothorax can be ruled out in this location. B lines again against that pneumothorax. The left side though, um, when you look at the left side, this one was very suspicious for a pneumothorax. There wasn't any B lines. There's no lung sliding. Um, so we, we were suspecting that there was a pneumothorax on this side. So mind you, uh, by the time we arrived, uh, the patient already had two uh, thoracostomies. So two large ball cannulae was uh, inserted in the chest by the anesthetists. Um, on both on the right and the left. But nevertheless, the left anterior zones were very suspicious for a pneumothorax. Okay, so going back to that chest compression phase and trying to identify the, the subcostal view. And then uh, with the last uh, couple of chest compressions, as you see, so I, I could already see some organized cardiac activity there, as you see. So there is some cardiac movement. There is some uh, valvular movement as well uh, in the, and the tricuspid and the mitral valves. And they stopped the chest compression. So rhythm check, charging the defibrillator. And this one was damped, uh, dumped. And um, nevertheless, uh, the arterial line uh, did show uh, some cardiac output uh, into the peripheries. So then uh, the patient did have ROSC. So we did have some uh, 
blood pressure at this stage. Had a look at the IBC. Trying to have a look at uh, the heart. So there, there wasn't a large pericardial effusion. Uh, there wasn't much in the way of, of a big blown up right ventricle uh, to suggest a huge PE. Uh, the LV function was pretty poor, but you know, he, he just had uh, cardiac compressions. So the LV function is fairly poor, but there's no pericardial effusion and there is organized cardiac activity. There is some flow through those valves as demonstrated here. So I had another look at those um, lungs while the patient had a pulse. Again, right one zone, B lines there. Um, so there's no pneumothorax in that location. So left side again, pleura, no pleural sliding, no B lines there. So very suspicious for a pneumothorax. Left two, same, no pleural sliding, very suspicious for a pneumothorax in that anterior part. Some B lines are coming in into that L3 zone and you see that that's a long point. And the L4 zone, again, some uh, B lines are coming up. So there was some lung movement. There was some air entry into that lung. However, uh, we were suspecting uh, an anterior pneumothorax despite the uh, thoracostomy cannula in. So then um, while uh, the, uh, we were requesting a, a chest X-ray as well at the same time, had, a, had another good look at the heart, uh, trying to um, again find some uh, causes that could have led uh, to the arrest. Very poor LV function, so we put the patient on an adrenaline infusion. In the meantime, the x-ray people arrived and that pneumothorax was confirmed with some uh, subcutaneous emphysema. So there's a large uh, left-sided anterior pneumothorax. And then uh, we put a chest drain in. So in this occasion, uh, the ultrasound was useful in detecting organized cardiac activity to rule out a few uh, potential causes. So there wasn't a, pneum uh, there, there wasn't a tamponade. We did uh, suspect the pneumothorax uh, based on the ultrasound findings at the end, we could deal with that. So on this occasion, there were quite a few um, images that were useful in guiding those resuscitation efforts. A second patient, who is a female with no past medical history. She was admitted uh, to the hospital with weight loss and chills and sweats, and she was cachexic. And based on imaging, um, they were suspecting that she had TB. So she had a big bilateral consolidation and the left side did huge cavitating lesion. So most, most of her left uh, lung was uh, eaten away with lymph nodes. And also on the CT, she was diagnosed with, uh, with a pericardial effusion there. She had an echo. Uh, she wasn't found to be in, in tamponade. She was on the ward. And then she had a met call, came down to ICU, and uh, she had repeat echoes, and those uh, ruled out tamponade. However, on day three in ICU, um, she became acutely short of breath. She was tachycardic, tachypneic. Uh, her lactate went up, so again, a new echo was requested. And as you see here, there is a pericardial uh, uh, effusion, uh, but the LVEF is, is very poor, 15%, as compared to normal EF uh, just a couple of days prior to that. They looked at the size of that pericardial effusion. It's a peri circumferential one, but there's the size of the pericardial effusion actually has improved uh, since the previous study. Very poor LV function was found on this echo. So while they were in there, the cardiologist and, and the intensivist and ongoing uh, little boluses of adrenaline were given, but the patient's MAP deteriorated and they lost output. So they started CPR immediately 
and all up uh, over the next hour or so we had more than 60 minutes of CPR and there were a variety of shockable and non-shockable rhythms and there was even a, a brief uh, period of rosk. And again, they requested uh, some ultrasound presence uh, during uh, the CPR, especially that the echo machine was already in there as the cardiologists were doing their uh, cardiology echo. So then we, we used the ultrasound to, to try to guide and rule out a few of those uh, factors uh, that could have led to her arrest. Mind you, that large uh, cavitating chest lesion, so she could have blown a pneumothorax or, or you know, something like that could have happened. So then um, we, we used the ultrasound to again to look at uh, the chest and in the left one zone, the left side was the worst. Uh, there are B lines in that zone. So as you see, so that rules out uh, pneumothorax in that location. B line pattern in the right one zone as well. So that rules out pneumothorax on that side. So while the chest compressions were going, uh, I tried to have a look at the heart and, and look at the size of the pericardial effusion. And again, uh, the size of that pericardial effusion uh, was unchanged. So that probably didn't lead to, uh, to the arrest. Same here, ongoing chest compressions and you see the size of that pericardial effusion. Same small pericardial effusion there can be seen. So when she had a, a brief period of ROSC, uh, that showed up on the ultrasound as well. As you see, some uh, little bit of flow could be demonstrated. So there is some valvular movement, some, some organized cardiac activity, but that only lasted for about 30 seconds. So we had to resume uh, CPR. So that was still uh, part of the ROSC and then she lost all that cardiac activity. And then towards the end, uh, towards the 60-65 um, the minutes of CPR, um, we had another look at the heart where we already were, were starting to think about uh, seizing our efforts. And in that, uh, the ultrasound helped again. So I, I had a look at that heart, there's absolutely no uh, organized cardiac activity and uh, there is no um, any no, no cardiac movement could be demonstrated at all so that supported our decision that we that we were making all together all the teams and all team members that we would seize our resuscitation efforts so in summary in my view and that is based on the literature and based on those uh, resuscitation guidelines. Ultrasound in peri-arrest is very useful. So when uh, the patient is acutely unwell, um, they are unstable, you can uh, take a few images and, and try to decide what makes them so unwell. However, in, in an actual arrest situation, it, it might not be that easy to use. You really have to uh, be very very well trained and, and very experienced if you want to try to help the resuscitation efforts. And even then, uh, you have to be extremely careful not to interfere with those resuscitation efforts because uh, the, the good quality chest compressions are the most important part of your ALS. So thank you for listening and I hope uh, this cleared up a lot of um, uncertainty around the use of ultrasound in a arrest situation. So thank you for listening. Until the next time, bye-bye.